Well, thank you, and I'm going to ask Greg to come up with me now. Uh, most of you got a chance to meet Greg and Caleb, and uh, Greg's wife Amy was with him the last time, and he did a Marriage Matters seminar here in Montague, and that was just a couple of years ago. And uh, for those who don't know, I had the privilege to be taught at Maritime Christian College. Greg was an adjunct professor there uh, a few years ago now, and he taught a course called the Turnaround Church. And he was able to teach a course like that because of the skill that he has and the depth of knowledge that he has to be able to come into a church and bring it forward. Uh, for those who don't know, Greg has been leading at Remedy Christian Church for about a decade now. And uh, you'll see very quickly that it's only in a matter of words when you talk to Greg, you find out that he is solid in his faith, he's grounded in God's word, and he's a good friend and a true brother of mine. So I introduce you to Greg Edens. Thank you. Appreciate it. Glad to be here this morning. I'm going to lift this. My son would probably say why, uh, but I do need it up just a bit here. Uh, you know, you asked uh, earlier just why are you blessed and how would you say that you are blessed? And I would just pause for a minute and say I'm so grateful to be here with my son, Caleb. He's 16 years old, he turned 17. He still wants to be around dad and mom for some reason. Uh, we must be all right. But uh, to be able to travel here and to be able to spend time with him, and I wasn't raised with my dad, so it's a real blessing to be here with my son and be a father to him, and he is a real encouragement to me. Except for one time, I want to share a story about the last time I wore a mic. Last time I wore a mic, Caleb turned it on in my back pocket. He was probably about this tall. He thought it was pretty funny, and I went to the restroom. And uh, the mic was on, and so they said, if it's on, you're recording. So I had to check the mic before I went to the restroom this morning. But what a blessing you are to me, son, and what a blessing many of you are here in Prince Edward Island. I am so grateful for the time I've spent with people, and what a blessing to come and have family in Christ. This is my home away from home when I come, and I've had time to spend with many of you, and I love the time that we got with you. So thank you for the way that you've treated Caleb and I this week as we've shared time with you here on the island. We love you guys. This is our family, our church family when we're away. So we're going to share some time with you this morning. We're going to be in the Word. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. And before we get into the Word this morning, I want you to do something with me. I want you to take your Bible. Take your Bible. And let me see your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, grab the one in front of you, right? Hold it up with me. Hold it up. Let's pray together this morning. Father, before we get into your word, we hold it high because your church is a place where we should hold your word in high regard. Lord, you know in our church at Remedy Christian Church, your word, we rely on it as our, as our number one uh, authority in our life. And here at Montague Church of Christ, it's the first core value. And so we hold your word high. And we say we hold it in high regard. We long to hear from it this morning. But not only do we long to hear from it, we long to respond to your truth spoken this morning to us from the printed page of truth that you've given us. What a blessing to hold your word and to hold it high. We want to hear from you this morning, Lord. Teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. And the book of Nehemiah is an incredible book. When I was in seminary, uh, I read many books on church leadership and one book after another after another, and Stephen could probably say the same, professors hand out books, leadership, here's another leadership book, here's another leadership book, and then I read the book of Nehemiah and I thought, why aren't my professors giving me this? Because it's the best leadership book I've ever read. So if you join me, I'm going to do what's just called a survey through the book of Nehemiah. It's going to go fairly quick because this is a long book, uh, but you don't want to be here for three or four hours. But let me just say this, that my message may go a bit longer than Stephen. And so if you've got somewhere to be, cancel your plans. So join me in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, verse 1, says this, The word of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and about Jerusalem, also about Jerusalem. Now, if we pause right here, we'd have to put things in context we always, as believers, want to put things in context before we get into the 
content of Scripture. And so if we put this in context, Nehemiah is coming off of the heels of the Israelites being in slavery. They had been in slavery for more than 70 years. Jeremiah had told the southern kingdom, after the northern kingdom had been judged, he told the southern kingdom, you repent and turn back to me. Stop acting like the nations around you who reject me, or you will be taken into slavery by the nation of Babylon. And what did the people do? You know, they what? Continued to reject God. They didn't repent. They didn't turn to God. So in 720, or 586 B.C., the southern kingdom was judged, and they came to ruin just like the northern kingdom before them in 722 B.C. And Jeremiah said, you're going to be taken off into slavery, into exile, to a pagan nation. You're going to get what you ask for. You're going to get it for 70 years, and for 70 years you're going to be in slavery. And if we were to read the book of Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, many scholars say they were one work in the beginning. We read them as two different works, but they record a lot of the same things. Ne Ezra actually records that first remnant coming back from slavery in Babylon, back into Jerusalem. And then Ezra is part of the second group that goes, and he begins to bring back the Word of God. They've rebuilt the temple, 516 B.C., the temple's been rebuilt. And Ezra comes back in, and he says the temple's been rebuilt, but something's missing. And the something that's missing is what? The Word of God. And if you read the book of Ezra, he's bringing them back. He's bringing them back to the Word of God. And then 14 years later, Nehemiah comes. And he notices something. See, he asked two very important questions. My brother Han and I came. I was in the citadel at Susa. He was serving the king. And he asked two questions that are going to be very important for us. He says this, I questioned them about the Jewish remnant. In other words, he asked about his people. And then also I asked about Jerusalem. I ask about my people, and I ask about that place. And he got a report. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and the gates have been burned with fire. Now, why are they in trouble and disgrace? Because a wall meant protection, safety around the city. And when Nehemiah comes back and he sees the temple's been rebuilt, the word of God is being reestablished, but there's no protective wall around the city the way it once was. And when a city laid open like that, it was in danger to outside nations coming in and attacking and overtaking that nation. And what Nehemiah asked, how are my people and how is that place? And the answer he gets is that they're in trouble and disgrace because there's no wall of protection and they're at risk from every side. You just think about today. You think about what Nehemiah is hearing for the first time. The people are living unprotected. They're living unprotected. And if you think about it today, there are five truths that Nehemiah teaches us today in a survey of the book of Nehemiah. And the very first thing is that people are living unprotected today. You think about how we're living unprotected spiritually. As we look at a younger generation that's growing up, they're not being taught how to guard their lives from sin. Anything goes in our community, and the world is infiltrating the church, and the church is afraid to talk about it. We're the instrument that God created to take the Word into the world, and instead the world is taking the Word, and they're shaping it in a way that it was never meant to be shaped. In fact, many churches, you walk into them, you can't even tell it's church anymore. You know, we could be a gathering of people where God has just snuffed out our flame. And man, if we ever become that here or at Remedy Christian Church, we are just a social group with a social gospel. It is no longer the truth. It's no longer the word. People are living unprotected. You think about families. Families are not guarding their marriage. In the United States, more than 50% of marriages end in divorce today. I don't know what it's like here on Prince Edward Island, in Canada, in North America, but I'd imagine it's very similar. One family after another falling apart. And there's hope if we have a broken family. There's hope. I come from a broken family. Wasn't raised with my dad. And so if you're here and you come from that, or in some way you have broken the family, there's hope. God is able to restore any Anything. Amen. He's able to restore. He's the God of hope. But are we protecting our marriages? 
Are we protecting our children by doing life with them, raising them in the Word, raising them in prayer, or are we teaching them how to live unprotected? You can go anywhere. Surf the social media. You can go anywhere now on your iPhone, right? You can go around the world in moments, and our kids see so much. You see, there are gaps in the wall spiritually in every one of our lives. And what God really wants is to close those gaps. He wants us to close the gaps, to heal us, to make us useful for the kingdom. Are we becoming that? People are living unprotected. But not only are people living unprotected, notice what he says then. Verse 4, he says, When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. And then he talks about his prayer, why he began to pray to God. But notice what he says first. When I heard, I sat down and I wept. For some days, this wasn't something that happened quickly for Nehemiah. What Nehemiah did was he was broken. He was concerned, but he was broken over the situation that he heard about people and the place that he loved so dearly because Jerusalem meant everything to a Jew. It's where the temple of God was. The gathering of God's people. Here today, the church represents that, that we are a gathering of God's people, a place where people can come in and find hope and healing. When's the last time we wept? When is the last time that you looked at your kids and you said, they are struggling, struggling with drug addiction, and when I pass places that say cannabis, and it's alive and well here, it's legal. Let me tell you, we're right behind you. We're right behind you in the, in the stuff that we're legalizing for the next generation. And we say it's not doing any harm. And we make jokes like they're not going to get hurt in a car accident because they're sitting at a stop sign waiting for it to turn green. That's not funny to me. You see, drugs are wrecking our kids' lives. Pornography is wrecking our children's lives. Sex addiction and all the things that they're struggling with. And why? Because our generation has struggled with it too. When's the last time you were so concerned over the brokenness of people that you wept, that you sat down and cried? I've raised four teenagers. I've made it through four, four teenagers. And Caleb is my last teenager, and he'll tell you we've sat down, and we've read the Word, and we've prayed. And we've walked through some very difficult times with our kids. There's a risk in thinking that everything looks perfect in my life. It's far from it. There have been plenty of challenges in my family, in my marriage, with my children. But one thing that we do is we keep coming back. And I've wept with Caleb. I've wept with my kids. I've wept over them. And I pray for them. I pray with them. And I study with them. And I've wept over the condition of the church. For 10 years, I've served at Remedy Christian Church. 10 years. It looks a lot like this church. And I'm thinking, Lord, why aren't more people coming? More people coming. You want to know why more people aren't concerned? They're not weeping over the condition of people and the community. We're not weeping anymore. We're too involved with ourselves. We're too concerned about our own schedule. Too concerned about what's going on in our life. What might make us happy? He wept and he fasted and he prayed. He mourned to the God of heaven. He, he prayed, and, and notice with me as he prays in verse 6, in the second part of verse 6, he says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, and my family, my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. In every instance, notice what Nehemiah does. We, he includes himself, and we many times are disobedient to God, even within the church. And we come in one Sunday after another, or whenever we can make it, right? And we allow the word of God many times to go in one ear and out the other. And what does Jesus say over and over again? He says, he who has ears, let him hear. How many of us have ears this morning? Raise your hand. You have ears? Some of you aren't raising your hands. I'm concerned about that. I'm raising my horn. Thank you. You got two sets of ears. God is saying, don't let it go in one ear and out the other. And Nehemiah here, he's confessing sin. And people, they're living unprotected. But number two, people are living unrepentant lives. Unrepentant lives. And we've lost the ability to speak truth to one another within the body of Christ. You think about this. When you and I 
uh, come to one another week after week, week, week after week. We may say things like, how's your, how's your week? How's your week? And we say, good. Well, Duke just shared a praise earlier. Has, has your week always been good? It's not always good, is it? But Duke might say, my week's been good. We need to dig on that a little bit more, don't we? Really? So how's your Crohn's disease? Because I got an opportunity to spend some time with you on the boat this week, and it was awesome. Thank you. But I got to tell you, I learned more about you than I knew last time I was here. And I'm praying for you. But we need to know. We need to know each other. We need to be able to have that ability to speak truth, pray truth, pray scripture over one another, and know how we're really doing. You know, people are living unrepentant lives, even within the church. And we come in, we just want to be catered to. And I'm not, I'm not saying that all of us want this, but I'm saying in general, when you think about what the church looks like today, how long is it going to go? How long is the service going to go? And can we beat the Baptist to the Swiss chalet? You know? And, and, and is the music going to be just right? Are they going to pick the songs I like? And am I going to get my spot? Well, you can easily have your spot this morning. But if someone's in it, just ask them to move, right? But we come in and we want to be catered to and we want all the right programs and we want the preacher and his family and the elders to look just right. And many times when we walk into a church, there are many people that have lost the desire to live repentant lives to turn back to to God. And people, even in the church today, are living unrepentant. And not only that, we think about people living unprotected, living unrepentant, but people are also living in a way that they're unwilling to lead. And so as I come in, and hey, Sunday morning, hour, hour and 10 minutes, hour and 15, and I'm out of here, and I'll see you next Sunday, right? And so we come in, and we think, I'm going to be served. I'm going to be served, and what the church needs to do is stand up and be the church. Who's called to serve in the church? Who's called to serve in the church? Who's called to serve in the church? Every one of us who call ourselves a follower of Jesus Christ. We ought to be developing a service mentality. Jesus said, I came to serve, not to be served, but to give my life a ransom for many. And what if the church started doing that again? We'd have an impact in North America, wouldn't we, Luke? People are unwilling to lead. And when people do lead, guess what? It, I'm telling you, as a pastor, who, I have elders alongside me. I have a family that leads with me. I can tell you that today is one of the hardest times to be someone who serves in ministry, whether it's as a volunteer or vocationally. When's the last time you prayed for your elders? Hey, elders, would you stand? I got a chance to spend some time with you this week. Would you stand up, elders? Elders, would you stand up? Elders who are being developed for eldership, would you stand up? Would your family stand up? Your wives, your children, would you stand up? Stand up, please. Uh, Many of you are thinking, I'm putting you on front street. Yes, I am. Hey, I want you to see some of the leadership in this church, your pastor, your elders, their families. You have committed to serving the Lord here at Montague Church of Christ, right? And it's not just you guys. It's your wives. It's your children. We are in ministry together. When's the last time you prayed over them? Hey, church family, would you stand with me for a moment? How about this? Put your hands on one of the elders or their family member that's close to you right now. Would you do that? Father God, as people move over to our elders, to Stephen and his family, God, we lay our hands on them right now. Thanking you that in a day and age where leadership has fallen by the wayside, where people are moving with fear instead of courage, thank you for men and their families who are willing to lead. I thank you for every one of them that I got to spend time with this week to see their heart for your church here. The people in this community, they love them. They long to see great things happen here. And God, I pray that as people stand with them now and put their hands on them, this wouldn't be something that stops today. As we lay their hands on them, we say, these are the people we love. These are the people we appreciate. These are the people we stand with. From our church at Remedy Christian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, we stand with these elders we have for a few years. We stand with Stephen and his family. And we stand with this church congregation now. And we say, we will stand together in the name of Jesus Christ. In a day and age where people don't want to lead, we will lead together. We say together in your powerful and precious name, Jesus, we say amen and amen.
Well, if you know the story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah wasn't afraid to lead, was he? This guy had courage. In fact, in chapter 2, he arrives. He, he, he goes before the king, and he goes very courageously. And he went before the king with a sad face. Do you know the story? No one went before the king sad because the, sad all, or the, the king always wanted you to put on a face. You better come in happy, even if you're not. You bring me down, it's going to cost you your life. And he went before him. He had a sad face. He was a cupbearer to the king, which means you took a sip of anything he drank before he drank it. And if you fell dead, then the king shouldn't drink it. What a job. How many of you would take that job? But he was a cupbearer to the king, and he basically protected the king from anyone killing the king by poisoning. And he goes before the king, and the king asks, what's wrong with you? And he, said, he describes his people, the condition they're in, the place. And the king allows him to go. In fact, here's what, uh, here's what Nehemiah says after the king asked him in chapter 2, verse 4. What is it you want? He says, then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I, a- and, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Ju- Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can build it. And then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you be back? And it pleased the king to send me. So I set a time. And Nehemiah, he goes. And when he goes, disruption begins, right? Because in verse 10, it says, when Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah and the Ammonite officials heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone has come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Let me just stop there because anytime we promote the welfare of the church from a scripture's point of view, from God's point of view, guess what happens? People very quickly get offended. People very quickly get offended and and we're like, oh, don't offend anyone. Hey, you know, don't have conflict with anybody. Are you kidding? But Jesus flipped over tables in the temple. Do you forget? He flipped over tables and he says, you brood of robbers. You've turned my father's temple into a den of robbers. He said, my father's temple is a temple of prayer. It's supposed to be a temple of prayer. Jesus offended people. And he didn't do it because he simply wanted to offend people. He wanted to get people's attention. And Jesus had conflict with a lot of people, didn't he? Jesus didn't always say what was easy. He didn't take the easy road out. No, he stood on truth. In fact, in Scripture, we learn in John chapter 1 that he came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace. He's full of truth. He will speak truth. And he goes and he inspects the wall. If you know the story, he inspects the walls at night because he doesn't want to be disrupted. He doesn't want people distracting him. He goes out, he inspects the walls, he makes a plan, and I love how... This is stated, what Nehemiah says in verse 16. He said, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priest or the nobles or officials or any other who would be doing the work. In other words, there are people that are going to be doing the work. They just don't know it yet. You know what the church is called to do? The work. We're called to do the work. And he goes out, he inspects, he evaluates the situation, then he comes back. He makes a plan. And his plan is that people will do the work together. In fact, in chapter 3, I've noted in my Bible, I don't know if you write in your Bible, I write in mine. In fact, Caleb will tell you I've passed on a Bible to him. It's got many, many notes. I love to write notes in my Bible. But I've written numbers down here 20 times in chapter 3 alone, next to him or next to them, or next to that. 20 times, at least, it's written there. They are building the wall around Jerusalem again. And you know what they start doing? They start doing it together. And people stop complaining, and they stop being distracted, and they begin to build the wall. And it's getting done, right, at a very rapid pace, next to them, next to him. And they're working together. And then opposition comes, doesn't it? If you know the story, opposition comes. And opposition comes in the form of outside worldly people, like the leaders in Trans-Euphrates. I brought some of them up, Sam Ballot, 
uh, Tobiah, some of them, they keep coming against Nehemiah. And they keep trying to disrupt him. In fact, they call him out, hey, we want to have a meeting with you. And he says, I know what you're up to. I'm not coming out there. I'm going to continue the work. They're just trying to distract us, deceive us, disrupt the work of the Lord. So he doesn't listen. And, and, and you and I have to remember something. Opposition is going to come. It's going to come from the outside. As I, I love this uh, island, by the way. I really love this island. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. And when I go downtown, Charlottetown now, what I notice is that anything goes morally or sexually in, on this island. Do you know when I go back to the United States, anything goes morally and sexually in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the United States? Well, I've traveled the world in Guatemala. I can tell you that when I go to Guatemala every year, we go to some of the most, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, the most secluded. What would you say? Remote. Remote. Thank you. Uh, sometimes we preachers can't get a word out. We go to some of the most remote places, and I can tell you that there they know, they've heard of Christ, and they are living the same way. It doesn't matter where we go in the world. People are struggling, and anything goes in our culture. And here, what we notice is that there's outside opposition today on this island to the church. How can you say that this isn't right for me? After all, what's right for me isn't necessarily right for you. We have different truths. No, there's one truth, and it comes from God. Is the church saying that? Are we standing on that anymore? Or are we just saying whatever the community, whatever the world says goes, hey, we'll give in. Everyone else is giving in. Remember what, uh, what Moses said to the Israelites in Exodus 23.2? He said, do not join the crowd in doing what is wrong. You know what the church is doing today? We're joining the crowd in doing what is wrong. It's too hard to stand. That's too much pressure, too much persecution to come on me, to come on this church. Oh, and if we stand, we're going to stand alone. You're not going to stand alone. You're going to stand with God. God stands with you. He stands with us. And we're going to lead people to truth instead of lies. And what is better? And this is better by far. And that's exactly what Nehemiah was doing. He's like, opposition is coming. I'm not going to allow it to take me off task for God. There's opposition that comes from the outside. By the time we get to chapter 5, there's opposition we see that comes from internally. Because the Jews are mistreating fellow Jews. They've caused them to sell all of their property, their vineyards. And the people are tired. They're hungry. They're trying to do the work. And Nehemiah's like, what's going on here? And they, they say, we've had to sell everything to our own people. And by the way, we're being charged interest on the loans that we're getting. And Nehemiah says, stop opposing the work of God internally. Give the stuff back. And when you give, don't charge interest. And you know what? It speaks very highly of the opposition that happens in every church across the world. There's opposition at Remedy Christian Church that comes up ever so often. Life is not easy in ministry. When we follow God, life isn't always going to be a bed of roses, right? A few weeks ago, I was preaching a sermon series that Stephen and I wrote together called Letters to the Church. I preached the church at Pergamum, and when I finished, I had talked about sexual immorality then and sexual immorality today, and there was a young guy that came up that just graduated from one of our local colleges. He left the church, and when he left for college, he came back, and he says, uh, I'm free. I've come out of the closet. Let everyone know that I'm homosexual. You're not free. You're a slave to the sin that you live in. The same way everyone who practices any sort of sexual immorality, like sex outside of marriage or uh, extramarital sex, anyone who practices pornography or any other sex that goes against the way God designed, we're not targeting one group. We say, hey, pornography, pornea, the Greek word for sexual immorality, includes every one of us, doesn't it? Every one of us. And we all ought to want to live better than that. And what's the Lord say to us? And we can't be afraid to stand against opposition from the outside. And we can't be afraid to stand against opposition from the inside. Well, what if people leave? I love what Francis Chan says in his book, Letters to the Church. If you haven't read it, read it. He says, what if people leave? Let them leave. And what if people go with them? Sometimes it's better if people leave. You know, I found that true in our ministry at Remedy. A few people have left. And there are times when people will leave the church. And you got to let them leave. And if they come back, you welcome them with 
open arms. You welcome them with open arms when they repent and they come back and they say, we want restoration. Jesus was always about restoration, wasn't he? The church has to be about restoration. We are all about restoration, but it doesn't mean we sit back and we do nothing about it. We have to hold accountability. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does. He holds accountability throughout Scripture. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, he holds accountability. And as we read further, we notice that in chapter 6, through more opposition and more opposition, in verse uh, 15, so the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in, the fi in 52 days. Isn't that incredible? You think about that massive wall in Jerusalem. And what Nehemiah had to do when opposition came was he had to remind people, stand up for truth, stand up and fight, stand up and work. He even put a military out in front of them to fight at the lowest part of the wall. Do you remember? And then he told the people, you stand up and you continue to do the work and you build the wall. Look what happens when God's people work together. We can accomplish great things. Is the church accomplishing great things today? If they can build a wall in 52 days around Jerusalem, can you imagine what we could do building walls in people's faith lives spiritually around them? Can you imagine what we could do in less than two months if the body of Christ actually became the body of Christ again and began to serve God the way that God has called us to serve? I want to share with you uh, four things, four things, five things actually, in order to rebuild the walls of faith we must. You think about the walls around Jerusalem, they were broke down. There were gaps in the wall. And in chapter 4, it says those gaps began to close. People were doing the work. People noticed, you know what? They wanted the gaps. Don't allow them to close those gaps because we won't be able to get in and pose opposition anymore. And when those gaps began to close, Nehemiah called people to do the work. And we're going to notice five things if we're going to rebuild the walls of faith here in Prince Edward Island. If we're going to do that, if we're going to do it in Indianapolis, Indiana, and around the world in order to rebuild the walls of faith, we must do this. We must first anguish over the damage that is, that is being done, the damage that sin is doing. We've got to anguish. I love what um, David uh, Wilkerson, David Wilkerson, famous preacher. Anyone ever heard of him? He passed away, started a church in Times Square, and that church began to reach gang members. And he had an incredible impact before his death, and he preached a sermon called Anguish. And he said, don't tell me you're concerned. When you sit and you watch TV or the computer, hours upon hours every day. Don't tell me you're concerned if you're unwilling to do something about it. Anguish, he said, is deep heartfelt pain for the condition of people and for the condition of our community. We have to feel that pain again for people and care enough about them that we anguish over the damage that's being done in the family, in marriages, in our community, in the church. we got to anguish again. So I ask again, when's the last time that you wept over the damage that sin is doing, has done, will do to people you're close to, to people you work with, to people you pass every day on this island? When is the last time we wept? We have to anguish over the damage that sin is doing. Number two, we have to approach our king in prayer and fasting. What's Nehemiah do? He has the courage to approach the king. And we have to approach the king again in prayer, in fasting. We fast. Why do we fast? And I wish I did it more. Anyone here good at fasting? You're just great at fasting. Man, I'm glad. Because I need to fast more. But you know, when you go without uh, food, I remember when Caleb told us when he was in elementary school, Dad, I'm going to start fasting with you on Friday mornings. And Amy said, our elementary school kid's going to go without food? Is he going to die? You know, he's not going to die, right? And we had to sit down and be reminded that every time we have a hunger pain, it reminds us that God will what? Provide. He's the provider. He's the bread of life. And he's the one we come to that we pray to and we fast we go without so that we realize that we have everything we need in Jesus Christ. we got to come before the king again and begin to pray and ask God to do the incredible. In fact, that next point is that we need to ask God to send us to do the work. Now, I don't know many of you here really well. I'm getting to know some of you. 
How many of you have professed a faith in Jesus Christ? You would say you've surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord, not just Savior. How many of you would say that? You ought to raise your hand proudly if that's the case. You ought to raise your hand proudly. Man, if that's the case, if that's the case, how often are we serving? When's the last time we ask God, use me like many of the people that we read about in Scripture. Here, my Lord, send me into a lost and broken world, into a lost and broken situation. Help me to be the difference in the world that I want to see. We have to ask God again to send us to do the work, and when we do it, we do it next to one another, encouraging each other, holding accountability, praying together, loving one another. You know, loving one another, by the way, doesn't mean accepting everything we do, does it? Somehow acceptance has become love, and love has become acceptance. And that's a lie. We don't accept everything in our lives that breaks God heart, God's heart, do we? And we can't accept everything within the church that breaks God's heart. We've got to confront it. We've got to be like Nehemiah. Confront it, confess it. We have to ha- be convicted again. We ask, have to ask God to send me. And here's number four. We have to anchor ourselves in Christ so that we can stand against ungodly opposition. I don't know what you face in this church. I don't know what you're facing right now. I can tell you this, that if it hasn't come, it will. Ungodly opposition. It's going to come. And there's a time coming that a friend of mine on the island reminded me of where people will call evil good and good evil. You you know, the time's come. It's here. And even within the church, people are going, oh, let's not have conflict. Let's let's not have conflict. Let's not do that with that person because then the community is going to hear about it. Let's not do this within the church. You know what we need to stop doing? Let sin reign, and we need to stop celebrating church sin within the church. We do. We have to stop celebrating sin. We've got to confront it. We have to be convicted. We have to confess it individually, corporately as a body in Christ. And I don't care if I'm going longer right now at this point than Stephen. I, I really struggled this week. I want to tell you how the Lord spoke through me. You see, because here's what happens as a preacher. Week after week, you're praying, God, give me the message, give me the message. And I came with the message, and I told Stephen, here's what I'm preaching. And midweek, I thought, this isn't what I'm preaching. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. And so by Friday, I settled. All right, here's the message. And I told Stephen, I've changed my message. This is the message. But God wasn't done. <laughs> and so he said, that's not going to be the message either. And I was unsettled, so unsettled, and I'm wrestling. Last night, I barely slept. My son barely slept. You know what I think? I think that's the Holy Spirit saying, be unsettled because I've got a message. And it might go a little longer than Stephen's, but it's going to be the message that I've given you. So when I woke up this morning, I had the message settled last night in my head. I couldn't sleep last night because the message, God wasn't done yet. I got up this morning and God gave me something different. And this is the message you're hearing this morning. See, it doesn't always come easy. And sometimes we need to be willing to wait and listen to the Lord. And I didn't want to listen because I'm thinking, i got to be organized. I'm in a church that I really don't know. I have to look good in front of people. And all the worries that you have, if you've ever public, uh, spoken publicly, right? And guess what? Sometimes we just have to realize that God doesn't care if we look good as long as we speak of the one who is good. And God is good. And so this morning I felt at ease, but uncomfortable, i got to tell you, because I'm still thinking, Lord, how am I going to do this when I haven't gone through it time and time again? God is good. And here is number four. We need to anchor ourselves in Christ so that we can stand against ungodly opposition. It's number four, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. It's going to come up on the screen. Paul warns Timothy, he says this, the Spirit clearly says, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith. Let me ask, if someone abandons the faith, that means at one time they were what? In the faith. we got to be very careful about our doctrine in the church. We cannot say that people are saved, once saved, always saved. People can walk away from their relationship with God. It's very clear here. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such things come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. 
See, we are living in a day and age where people's consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Let me just ask, can we, all of us in the room, see, in my church, I don't worry about people online. I don't worry about people who might hear the message later. I worry about the people who have come. And that might offend some people. But you can answer me this morning because you're here. Can you still feel a sensitivity to sin in your life? Or if we've been doing it for so long, we can't feel God's conviction because it's still there. Jesus said the Holy Spirit came to convict the world of sin. Can you feel it? Can I feel it? Or have I been so involved in it for so long that it's simply become okay? You know, to God, it's not okay. It's damaging the relationship between us and him. And by the way, the sin that so easily entangles us also impacts the people around us. Our wives, our children, our friends, extended family, people we work with. And we, when we can't feel God's conviction anymore, it affects people around us. We have to anchor ourselves in Christ so that we can stand against ungodly opposition. And here's number five. We have to allow God's word to guide us and to guard us. Maybe you're thinking, how much longer is this going to go? I'm going to bring it to a close right here. You know, in Ephesians 15, 4, 15, and 16, Paul writes this to the church at Ephesus. He says, he's, he's speaking of spiritual maturity before he gets into these verses. And he talks about how we all need to be maturing so that we're not tossed by the waves of the sea. When a ship is tossed by the waves, what happens to that ship? It could be torn to pieces. That's what happens to people's lives when they don't give their lives to Scripture, surrender their life to God, to His truth. They are just tossed in this life like a ship in the wind, beaten by the waves of a storm. And here's what Paul says. He says, instead, we ought to be speaking the truth in love. We will, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head. That is Christ. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You know the verse. There's the work again, right, that we're supposed to be doing together as we mature. How do we mature? we got to speak the truth in love to one another. And so many times when this happens, when accountability takes place, I can tell you in my own life, accountability has hurt. Has the truth ever hurt you? Raise your hand. Somebody's spoken truth into your life. You're like, man, that hurt. And at first, it may even form some conflict between you and them. But if, if you're like me, you've left and you start thinking, was that person right? Has that ever weighed on your mind? And then you go, man, they were. They were right. And then it's, what are you going to do about it? And the truth hurts but the truth transforms our lives into the likeness of Jesus Christ more and more. That's what spiritual maturity looks like. A friend of mine said years ago, pain is an indicator something is wrong. Duke, when you have pain, you know something's wrong. You know you got to get it checked out. And if you don't check it out, guess what? You're going to be in danger, right? You ever felt pain in your life? Raise your hand. Physical pain? you got to do something about it. Sometimes we ignore the pain. We ignore the pain. We ignore the pain. It persists, and we go, oh, oh i got to check it out. You know what? Pain is a gift from God. It indicates something's wrong. Something wrong in your marriage, and there's pain? Pain's an indicator. Something's wrong. You need to get help. I mean, that's, that phrase stuck with me. And sometimes truth caused pain in my life and causes pain in my life. But there are people that have the right to speak truth into my life. I've given them the right. They love me. They want what's best for me. And they have the right to speak truth into my life because they want what's best. And I know that. Do you have people like that? Raise your hand. You got people like that you allow to speak truth? Or are we always on edge and we think, man, that was offensive. Well, that person doesn't have a right to judge me. Or maybe we have uh, made this statement or we have the tattoo, right? Only God can judge me. No, it's not true. We have a right to hold one another accountable in the body of Christ. And we need to start doing it again. We need to allow the word of God to guard and guide us. We need to speak the truth in love. And I'm going to end with this, Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. What would happen if we rise up like Nehemiah was calling the nation of Israel to rise up? What if Christians were to rise up today 
and begin to become the people God has called us to be again, what could we accomplish in the world? How could we advance the gospel for Christ? And how could we bring people to salvation for the Lord? I'm here to tell you, like the Israelites, we'd have a great impact, wouldn't we? Isn't that what we long for? We're going to move into a time of communion. And I know this might be a bit different than you normally do it, and that's okay. Sometimes we need to be shaken up a little, right? We don't want to fall into routines. But I like the fact that every week you celebrate the Lord's Supper because in Scripture it says every time we come together we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ whose body was broken on the cross for us, whose blood was poured out. It was a decision he made to pour out his blood. He said he made his life a ransom for many. I challenge you during communion today to do something that Paul calls us to do in 1 Corinthians. He talks about communion and how we ought to take communion. And, you know, Nehemiah went out and he went out and he evaluated the wall with no distractions. You know what I'd ask you to do before you come forward this morning and take communion? I'd ask every one of us in the room just to sit and bow your head and pray silently and evaluate your own life with no disruption, no distraction, and evaluate your life the way Nehemiah evaluated the wall. And then, what's the plan? What are you going to do if your life isn't in order the way God would want it to be in order? Before you come up for communion, if you want to pray, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to step to the back. I'm going to step to the back, and maybe this morning you're saying, I need to confess, or I need to really pray about something I'm convicted about. I need to get involved. I'm going to step to the back. I'm going to ask Stephen to step back there with me, and we're going to be back there during the time of communion to talk and to pray with people. Would you stand with us? Father, this morning as we prepare our hearts and minds for communion, we stand together. In honor of you, Jesus, the famous one, we thank you for the gift of life that you've given us. Jesus, you are the bread of life. We celebrate that through communion this morning. And before we sit and ponder, think about our own life, Father, we stand in reverence of you, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father. We stand in reverence of you. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift that you've given us. Thank you for being our advocate, the one who teaches us, leads us, guides us, convicts us and reminds us of everything that Jesus said. And as we stand together this morning, I pray for a bond of unity and maturity in the the church of Christ. All over the world, I pray that we would become more urgent in the way that we love you and that we serve you. We give you praise right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, powerful name, his powerful name we pray and we say together.